this time. This is uh, honestly one of my favorite times of worship where we get to stand together and we get to pour out our hearts through music and through songs. So if you would and are able to stand with us right now, I encourage you to do so and not to worry about who's around you or if they think you're a good singer or not, but just to be at one with God this morning and to sing praises to his name. That's what we're here to do. So let's sing together Forever Rain. You are good, you are good. When there's nothing good in me, you are love, you are love. On display for all to see, you are light, you are light. When the darkness closes in, you are hope.
never be. We live for you. We live for you. And only there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show.
Dear Lord, help to remind us uh, that we can put all of our trust in you, and we thank you for this time, because time and again you show us how, Holy Spirit, you take words off the pages of scripture and bring them directly to our hearts. We pray this morning that we would not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word as well. Take it with us, transform us, Lord, um, turn us into uh, fully developed disciples of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Y'all take a seat, and kids are welcome to go to WOW Worship if they like. Thank you. If you hear the kids yelling, that's mine, so don't worry. Ah. Uh. Fear, it seems like everybody is talking about fear these days. And in fact, when you start to do an exhaustive survey of kids' movies that have been out the last few years, you see that like, fear is actually the subject of almost every kids' movie these days. Um, it's true of that. It's true of every Oprah interview. It's true of every Brene Brown book that comes out or TED Talk or whatever. It's just everyone... It, when it, even when people talk about the stock market, what they're really talking about is the impact that fear is going to have on the economy. It's just fear is part of the conversation all over the place, and for good reason, because we give it way too much power in our lives. Of course, to be fair, there is good fear. There's a response in our brain that keeps us out of danger. This is a good thing. It's the thing that keeps us from intentionally eating something that's poisonous, right? Or that keeps us from wanting to go into the tiger exhibit at the zoo. Hopefully that works with the little ones. Um, it keeps us from driving in the opposite lane of traffic when we're driving, right? I mean, like, so some fear is good and helpful, but sometimes we give our fear way too much power. We exaggerate and we act like things are going to happen that are never going to happen. We brood on very unlikely things. Like, I have this fear of snakes, right? Now, I know that there's only four kinds of snakes in our area that are poisonous. I know what they are. I know how to identify them. But I'm not only afraid of those four kinds. I just hate all snakes, right? And I'm afraid of all of them. And if I see any of them, I scream and run, right? Like, that, that doesn't make any sense. That's not rational. But it's, it's what fear does in my head, right? Or I'll just be driving down the road, and if anybody looked through their car window into mine and they saw me, I would look like a relatively reasonable person, you know, logical, whatever, and I'm doing this. But really what's in my mind is the fact that I'm driving over a bridge, and my mind is down in the river, and I'm thinking about what I will do if and when my car ever goes over the bridge into the river. My windows manual, or are they electric, and how much water is pouring in, and at what rate, and why don't I have a crowbar in my car you know like those are the things that are going through my head and so I look like this but in my mind I'm like this right fear just like it comes up all the time and it does strange things in our heads and now we are well aware of the way that we are afraid of bad things right I mean like we try to keep it in check we keep it in perspective but we're afraid of bad diagnoses we're afraid of loved ones being in accidents we're afraid of losing our jobs and even while we acknowledge these and we try to keep them contained to like an appropriate space in our minds, they're understandable. Like anyone could be sympathetic with that kind of fear. But there is another kind of fear. It's one that is almost as pervasive as that one, but we hardly ever talk about it. And so I want you to take a moment with me this morning to really explore this with me. It's the fear of of something good and you know whenever I was in elementary school I went on another ropes course with my dad and it, they had like the the wall the, the rock wall you would climb and then you would lay down it and then there were like the rolling logs that you would walk across that were suspended up in the air you know and there was a zip line and those all looked fun and I wanted to do them and I did do them but then there was another thing out there. It was called the pamper pole. It was called that because you should probably be wearing some pampers while you do it. 
and uh, it's not that, it's this. And uh, so what it is is essentially it's like a telephone pole, and it has like these iron pegs, you know, and you climb it. You're in a harness, but you climb it, and then once you get to the top, there's like nothing up there, and you like you figure out how to like move one foot up, and then you get the other one, and so eventually you're just standing up straight tall uh, on a telephone pole, and once you do that, you're supposed to just jump right off. Yeah. You know, I never did the pamper pull. I never did it. It's the one thing I wouldn't do. And do you know why? I wasn't afraid of not being able to do it. I wasn't afraid of, like, missing one of the iron pegs. No, I was afraid of succeeding. Like, I did not want to get up there because I didn't want to have to take the leap, right? And still to this day, maybe one day, I don't know, but I still have not done the pamper pull yet. Can you think of times when you've been afraid of succeeding? Times when you've been afraid of something that could be great? Perhaps a daughter going off to college, you know? And you want her to, and you're really proud of her, but you are afraid of, like, what could happen to her and what kind of experiences they might have. Or maybe your son is getting married, and even if it's to a good woman, you wonder, like, what is this going to do to our relationship? What impact is this going to have on us? Have you ever been afraid of getting a promotion? Feeling like, oh, I don't know if I'm up for this. I don't know if I'm really going to measure up. We are all afraid of bad things happening, but deep down in places that we don't quite open up as much about, many of us find that we are afraid of good things, too. Sometimes we're afraid because what we already have is so good that we are certain that any change to it whatsoever is going to have to make it worse, right? There's other times in our lives, though, that what we have isn't even really that good. It's just that we know it and we're comfortable with it and we understand it. And so that is preferable to us than some other future that could be better for us, but that has a whole lot of uncertainty wrapped up in it. You see this all the time, for example, with abused women, you know, and the situation they're in is not great, and the future they could have apart from their abuser is much better than their current reality, but, um, you know, there's all these uncertainties of how am I going to you know, how am I going to have enough money to feed my kids? Where are we going to live? What kind of job am I going to get? And all of the uncertainties about the possibility of something better keeps them from living in the situation that isn't really so great to begin with, you know. A much, you know, a really drastic example of this that someone told me this week was how there was this time there were prisoners of war and they were being lined up um, to a, like, and they had an option. They could go to the firing squad or they could go through this black door. And person after person was chewing, choosing the squad. And so one of the guys from the other army, he turns to his CO and he says, what's behind the black door? And the CO says, freedom. And they said, well, then why are they choosing the squad, you know? And he goes, because they know what it is, you know? And that kind of fear happens on the daily, friends. I mean, and not as drastically as that, perhaps, but of the same variety. This fear of the unknown keeps us from something good. It's like, it's like me at a restaurant. Uh, you know how there are two kinds of people at a restaurant? The people who go, and every single time they go, they try something new and different, and they're always adventurous, and they, like, they see it as like this grand thing. That, anyway, it's a like, fun adventure for them. Then there are the people who find the one thing that they like at that restaurant, and they get it every single time they go without fail. I am a tried and true girl. <laughs> You know, I do not enjoy the risk because what if I got something else off the menu and it was terrible and the whole time I'm sitting at the table, I'm thinking I could have had that other thing that was better, right? We do this all the time. There's something good that we already have and it keeps us from something that's potentially great because what we have is good enough. In fact, Jonathan Ivey is this famous guy at Apple, but he's also famous for saying good is the enemy of great, you know? When what we've got is good enough, then we don't ever take the leap to something greater. 
And it keeps us from so much thrill and joy, adventure and thriving. But this kind of fear, fear of something good, is not only about personality or circumstances or experiences. It is a spiritual issue in our relationship with the Lord. And there was this moment in Jesus' life where folks struggle with this very thing came to the forefront of Jesus' ministry. So we're going to go and check it out this morning. Go ahead and grab a Bible. Maybe you brought one from home because you can mark it all up or you can pull one from a chair in front of you. Pull it up on your phone too. We're going to be in Luke, which is pretty far back. It's after Matthew and Mark. We're going to begin in Luke chapter 8, verse 26. And Jesus is with his disciples whenever he shows up on this scene, okay? Verse 26, here we go. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. If, it, if you're thinking about the Sea of Galilee as a clock, it's like at 3 or 4 o'clock, okay? So that's where it is on the Sea of Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time, he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demons into the wilds. And Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now, there was on the hillside a large herd of swine, pigs, that were feeding. And the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. And so he gave him permission. And then the demons came out of the band, entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off. And told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were excited, overjoyed, afraid. Yeah, afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. And then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and left. Hmm. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So the man went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of God for the people of God. So Jesus shows up on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. The western side was the Jewish side. The eastern side is the Gentile side. He goes over there and immediately encounters the biggest concern that that community has. There's a man who is troubled, who is afflicted, and, um, and so he is kind of, he's not safe for himself or for others. Uh, his family was trying to keep him in a good situation at home. It says that he had been bound up there so that he wouldn't be a danger to himself, but he had found a way to get out of that. So now he's been living in a graveyard. Doesn't he can't even keep clothes on? You can't hold a conversation with him. You can't look him in the eye. There's no smile. You know, it's, and back then there wasn't really an understanding of mental illness. And so some of the times when there's a healing, it's it can be that. But we know in this situation, and some of you in the room, I think, know that there is a such thing as spiritual evil as well. And we know that that's what this man was dealing with uh, because of the kind of interaction that Jesus had with him. And so immediately Jesus steps ashore and he meets this man and he has compassion for him and wants to heal him. And so he does. Like the man is not injured. He's not harmed. He's not hurt. He's just 
not well in one moment and then totally well in the next moment. I mean, it's an incredible miracle. And for the whole community, who, folks who were worried about their kids or whatever, whenever they would come, like, it's all, it's solved. It's fixed. I mean, it's an incredible thing to return this man to his life, to his family, to friendships, to work, to a home. And so people find out. You know, they start to spread the news, and they come and they see for themselves, oh, my gosh, he is totally fine. And if it were me, I think I would have thought, oh my gosh, let me go grab great aunt Sue because I bet Jesus could go and help her. And here's this little boy over here whose leg doesn't work right. Maybe Jesus can help him. And this is a wonderful day for our community because Jesus is here. But that's not what they do, is it? No, instead they ask Jesus Christ to leave their town. They ask him to go. What in the world? What, how, what were they, how did that happen? How were they so afraid of the goodness of God that they asked Jesus to back off? I mean, was it, were they afraid that if Jesus turned his sights to them, that he would uncover something in them that they didn't really want brought to the forefront? Was it that they were concerned that their life was good enough the way it was and that if they allowed Jesus to participate in their community that he would change things and they didn't want the change, they, if things were fine? I suppose it could have been a financial thing, you know, because like the pigs are gone, <laughs> that might have been a source of income. Like, I would think, like, it's a good trade-off. We lost some money, but now this man is totally well and healed, but maybe they were just ticked off that they lost. All the, you know, that part of the story is so funny. It's a reminder to us. We've got to be really careful what we pray for because the demons said to Jesus, hey, we just don't want to go into the abyss. And Jesus says, okay. And they say, okay, um, can we go into the pigs instead? And said, Jesus says, Okay, and so they go into the pigs who immediately go off a cliff. Uh, this cliff, actually, I don't know if we have, there it is. Um, that's the cliff in, over in Gerasene on the Sea of Galilee. They go off the cliff and immediately go into the abyss, right? So they get exactly what they didn't want because they, anyway, we've got to be careful what we pray for. So, so there, maybe that's just the situation, like they are afraid that Jesus is going to ask something of them that they don't want to give, that there's going to be sacrifice involved in, in a walk with him. I don't know. Whatever it was, they were afraid, so afraid that they asked Jesus Christ to get out of their lives. And the scariest part of this story isn't actually the healing of the man or the pig situation or whatever else. It's the fact that Jesus left, right? They ask him to go, and he goes. I got to tell you, uh, there have been times when I've been afraid of God. They're usually when God is trying to get me to do something new, and I'm afraid of stepping into that new thing like I don't want to take the leap off the pole you know it's like maybe he'll say I want you to go over here and talk to this person and I'll say oh but what if I don't know what to say or what if you know they it's awkward and then they don't want to talk to me in the future and then it's this whole thing or maybe there's been times I know there's been times where Jesus has kind of wanted me to like take on this new thing that's a part of his ministry, and I'm like, I don't know that I can do that. I already have so much on my plate, and I don't know if I have time, and how am I going to handle that, and I don't even know if I have the skills to do it well, and, and then what if that takes my life in this whole different direction, and I've kind of got my life mapped over here, and I'm comfortable with that, and this is good, and I don't know where that's going to lead me. I don't know what's going to happen if I start down that road. Those are the times when I've been afraid of God. And I've been kind of like, all right, God, thanks, but, you know. Paula, one of our children's directors, she was the one who did the message this morning. And she, she told me this week how over the course of years, 
uh, the children's ministry position had been opened three times. And every single time she had felt a nudge of a calling to take it. And she had shut that down quick. Because <laughs> she thought that she wasn't, she didn't have the gift, right? Fortunately, Jesus kept coming back to her. You know, fortunately for all of us. Um, you know, uh, Marianne Williamson, she wrote, our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us. You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine just like children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we, we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. You know, as I think about the people on the shore that day, I realize that there's one person in the story who never functioned out of fear who never once made a decision in his life based on fear. Who, I mean, you know who I'm talking about, right? I mean, it was Jesus. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, even walking up to the cross, he could have turned away. He was God. He never once made a decision based on fear. You know, he knew was God. He knew what was going to happen when he showed up that day. He could have been afraid of failure. I'm I feel confident that he was concerned about leaving the entire salvation of the world in the hands of 11 disciples. Like, there were things that he had to be afraid of. That day, he knew that he was going to be rejected. He knew that they were going to ask him to leave, that they, were gonna, they, that they didn't want him in their lives. That did not stop him from going ashore. It didn't stop him from thinking, you know what, I'm only going to reach one person. And that one person is 100% worth it. Because now here is this man who everybody knows what his life was before. And he has a much more powerful witness of the transformation and salvation of Jesus Christ. Because they've seen it happen in his life. And he goes around the whole countryside of the Gentiles telling everybody about Jesus now. It was 100% worth it to Jesus to go there even knowing that they would reject him. And I think it's important for us to realize that the possibility or likelihood of struggle or failure does not negate the calling in the first place. Just because it might blow up doesn't mean it wasn't a calling from God. And you know, we know from Romans chapter 8, it says that God is working for good for all those who love the Lord and walk according to his ways. We know that if God is leading us to something new, to take a leap, that it's for the better for our lives. And yet there's that thing that kind of keeps us shrinking back, right? But Jesus did not only not function in fear himself, he invited us into a life with him with the presence of his spirit beside us and within us to say, you know what, you don't have to live that way either. You can live knowing that I'm right here with you. And actually, at the end of the day, it's not the Gerasenes who I'm most interested in in this story, and it's not even the pigs, though that's kind of funny. There's the man who Paula rightly mentioned was living in fear his whole life, and then becomes the only person who isn't afraid out of his community. But it's actually, it's actually the disciples. It's the silent disciples who are standing by watching this whole thing that I am most interested in. Because something had happened to them like five minutes before they land on shore. Do you know what it was? I mean, the Bible tells us, Luke chapter 8, they were on the boat crossing from Capernaum, from Galilee, over to the land of the Gerasenes, and while they were crossing the Sea of Galilee, there is a large storm that comes, and the 
the disciples are, they're afraid. <laughs> they are afraid. They are terrified of the storm. And they say, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to drown? And Jesus stands up and he calms the storm and he looks at them and says, you have little faith. <sighs> Why are you afraid? Don't you know I'm with you? They had literally just had an, ins an experience where they, they went through that whole thing with fear leading the way. And then they get and they put their feet on the sand and they walk up into the land of the Gerasenes and now they are confronted from the other side of what it looks like for other people to be functioning out of fear. They see it. They're just observing it. They realize, like, oh, my gosh, this has led these people to, to, to place Jesus to the side. Like, they're asking him to go. This is crazy. This is ridiculous. But they were just doing it 10 minutes earlier. So what I'm really interested in is the mindset of the disciples when they get back into the boat, right? Because we know that each one of them eventually made a choice. Eleven of them made one choice, one of them made the other. But they had to make a choice. Whether they were going to repeat the storm story, repeat the mistake of the garrisons, or could they step forward in faith knowing that if God was calling them to it, it was better than anything that they had for themselves. And friends, just like the disciples had to make that choice a little later on, you and I, we have to make choices like that every day. Every day we have decisions where we can decide whether we're going to be led by our fear or by trust in the Lord. And my prayer for you today is that it'll be a choice not to narrow your future with fear, but to shine and to step confidently forward in faith with the Lord. Let's pray together. God, we're, um, gosh, we're grateful for these stories that in some ways seem miles and miles away from life today, but in other ways are just so relevant and clear to us. Um, because human nature hasn't changed all that much, and, and we see ourselves in these stories. We pray, Lord, that, um, that that fear that often comes gnawing at our hearts, that we would just set it aside and say, no, I trust the Lord. I trust the Lord. I trust the Lord. And that we can walk in the hope and the joy that comes from shining as a child of God. Help us walk into that, Lord. We thank you for um, the opportunity to give a portion of what you've given to us back to you because we see you accomplishing some pretty amazing things through it, like our kids at summer camp this past week and the ones who are going to Big House this coming week. You're doing incredible things in their lives. We thank you for letting us be a part of it. And so we pray that all the gifts that are given today would be used according to your purposes in our church, in our community, and around the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
take a seat just a second and I want to invite forward all of our folks who are going to Big House later this week. All right. We want to send them off with a prayer of blessing as they go. Yeah, I know several of them weren't able to be here today. So the, uh, the, this is a mission trip that will be on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this week. And it, they'll be doing home repair projects uh, for folks who are in need. And so I ask you, do you recognize that you're being sent forth by God? Do you accept the responsibility of representing this congregation? Do you dem will you demonstrate Christ's teachings and commit yourself to serving faithfully on this trip in ways that bring honor and glory to God? Very good. Let's pray together, friends. Guiding and loving God, we ask that you empower these folks who are attending Big House this week. Help them to glorify you by serving others. Send them into the world to befriend the lonely, provide hope to the hopeless, and be ambassadors of your great love and passion for rescuing your people. Protect them, teach them, and support them as they take this step this week. Fill them with the Holy Spirit and bring them safely home. And let them continue to experience discipleship in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. All right, let's stand together for the, benef the benediction today. If you are a first-time visitor with us, we encourage you to drop by the Welcome Center on your way out. Uh, we have a little gift as a way of saying thank you. And then we have Susan and Sherry here. They are prayer partners. They would love to pray for you as the service closes. If you have anything that you would like to be prayed for this week, I encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity. We have 15 spots left in Vacation Bible School, so if you know a kid who would like to participate, Help them get registered this week so that they don't miss their chance. And we're still looking for six more adults to help us out. So let us know if that could be you. As we go from this place, remember God goes before you to show you the way, behind you to keep you moving, above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, within you always to give you peace. Amen.